right, everyone. So let's just get started. We'll kind of generally speak about the hub and things like that. So nothing too critical if someone's still trying to log on. So basically, just to start, my name is Kara, and I'm the advisor for computer systems students for the class of 2023. I was also the computer systems advisor last year, so it's definitely a curriculum I'm comfortable with. Um, I'm also the advisor for electrical and materials, and for you all, um, I would say electrical is important to know because some of you might end up crossing over. What? Sorry, one of our, as a side note, one of our other hub advisors is on the chat. It's the Val hub advisor. That is, in fact, a hub advisor. So if you have questions throughout the webinar, just go ahead and let her know that, and we will answer them all at the end. So. Just to give you a brief overview of what the hub is, we are the first year side hub. So during your first year at Rental Leader, for all academic questions, we are your one-stop shop. So some of the big things we always tend to work with students on are talking about major requirements, minor requirements, general education requirements. Um, we also help you make your four-year plan if that's something you want to do so that we can figure out what it looks like to pass all the way to graduation. And then, again, we are really a good first stop for any sort of question. So if you want to know how do I work study abroad into my plan or I don't know where to go on campus to get help with career stuff, then we are always happy to direct you. If we're not the person who's going to answer, we at least will know who could be that person. Um, so you will be with us exclusively for your first two semesters. And then in your third semester, you will transition to having a faculty advisor. And so basically, at that point, we hope that our year together will have set a foundation where you understand the basics of all of your requirements. And then once you move to the faculty advisor, you can have some of those higher order conversations about things like which really specific technical upper level elective do I want to take? Because they might teach that class whereas I would never have even taken it. Um, they also could talk to you about research and all these other fun things. So that's the advising model here, and it tends to work out pretty well. Um, now, moving on to your department, computer systems is part of a larger department called ECSV, or Electrical and Computer Systems Engineering. You guys are one of the bigger departments on campus, and that is to your advantage in a lot of ways. Main way you'll see, as we'll kind of talk about throughout the webinar, is you have a lot more curriculum flexibility than a lot of majors here in the School of Engineering. So as we're making our plans, one thing that'll be nice for you throughout your time here is you have a lot more choice. And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So with that being said, we're gonna kind of do a quick overview of all the resources I've been sending out to you all the last couple of weeks. And we're gonna to try to keep the talking portion of this like 20, 25 minutes on my end. That way I can leave as much time as we need for all of your questions. So with that being said, just give me a moment to share my Green. Okay, so hopefully this looks familiar, but this is your computer and systems registration guide. So obviously I would say read all of this. It's an amazing crash course in Rensselaer academics, and this is not even just orientation specific. This has a lot of information that I would say you should be referencing your whole first year when it comes to preparing for registration. So just a couple of highlights as we go along. Um, as we talk about curriculum planning, we will always be looking at these things called a major template. So yours is embedded right in the guide. So again, we'll be talking about this in a little more detail in a moment. But what this is, is a basic four-year map of all the requirements you must fulfill to graduate with a computer and systems degree. Now, my catchphrase here is this is a guide, not the gospel. So a lot of students understandably get very nervous if they go to register and they don't look exactly like this template. But I will tell you, I don't know if I know any CSEs who are 100% on template. This is one of the more flexible curriculums. And so things will move around and that's okay. So moving along for other highlights here, we will talk about scheduling today. And then if you haven't already made yourself very well acquainted with Section 3, then I would highly recommend it if you have AP, IB, or other college credits coming in. Now, one question we've been getting a lot over the last few weeks across all advisors and all majors is we are very well aware that um, your final round of AP scores will not be out by the time you register next week, and that's okay. So my advice is if you walk out of that exam and you, like, no, you're just like, I bombed it, that did not work out. 
that's fine. Don't assume credit, just register. For example, if you took calculus for your AP and you were like, no way that works, fine. Register for Comp 1. But as long as you feel okay or better about the AP, my recommendation is assume you have credit and move on to the next class appropriately. We've done some in-house studies here at RPI to see how that goes for students. And by and large, students do really well when they take their credits and run with it. And the nice thing is, no matter what decision you make, it's not that high stakes because the first two weeks that you're here in the fall is what we call the add drop period. So during those two weeks, you can kind of get a taste of the class. And if you're in there and you're like, you know what, this is way too hard. I'd rather re like redo this material. Fine, just drop a level down. I can help you move your schedule around. It's totally fine. So basically when you're building your fall schedule, you want to know what credits you already have. So definitely take some time to suss that out before Monday. And then last but not least, I would highly recommend watching all the way through the Haas Corps and everything about the pathways. So one thing that's very nice is since we have made this guide, they've actually shared the pathways live. So I'll ask my colleague Val if she can maybe drop a link to the pathways in the chat on the webinar. That way you all can start to kind of parse through that. So HOS is your general education requirements at Rensselaer. It stands for Humanities, Arts, and Social Sciences. And you have to take five over four years. If you have AP or transfer credit, you can use up to eight credits in your HOS core. Um, so if that's you, then you really want to start looking at the pathways because there is definitely the potential that you could start your pathway and be done with HOS in three classes once you get here. So those are the main things I want you to really hammer in on before Monday with the registration guide. But again, this has some amazing information that you can and should reference your whole first year. So with that being said, let's move on to templates. So let me just swap the share. So we talked a little bit before about templates. So I'm pulling yours up. This is the same one in your registration guide. So let's just talk a little bit about what's here in like the first two semesters primarily, but even the first two years. Um, now there is a registration video that goes through your templates. I'll try not to belabor that too much because you could watch it from the guide. But basically the parts of your first semester I would say should be rock solid are that you want to take a computer science course for like 90, 8% of you, that is going to be computer science one. Then the other things that I would say definitely, definitely put in your first semester are a math course. And um, again, the registration guide kind of covers if you have credit for Calc 1, move on to Calc 2, so on and so forth. And then I would definitely want you all to take a HOP class your first semester. Now, your IHSS has to be done in your first year. So whether you do that in the fall or spring doesn't matter. But Coming into RPI, I know that you likely love math and science if you're coming in to be an engineer, but we really want to make sure that first semester you have some balance, so it's not just four heavy-hitting STEM classes, and that HOS will give you that balance. So as we go through the three non-negotiables for your first semester, a HOS, a computer science course, and a math course. Now, some of the other things in here, you can mix around. So one of those is intro to ECSE, and I gave a whole spiel about it in the video and the registration guide, but basically, that is a course that is intended for half of electrical and computer systems students to take in the fall and half to take in the spring. So don't panic if you don't get in your first semester. It's kind of by design in a lot of ways, but it's a great intro to the major, get some good hands on experience. One thing I will mention is that there is a more general version of that course called Intro to Engineering Analysis, or IEA. Now, that course, IEA, counts for all majors, including electrical and computer systems. If you take intro to ECSE and then switch out of electrical or computer systems, so for example, let's say you took ECSE 1010 and switched to mechanical, then ECSE 1010 would become a free elective, which you can see down here. You still need, but you only get 12 credits of those. And then you would still have to take IEA. So basically, my recommendation is if you're unsure if you want to do electrical or computer systems, then it could be a good one to put off till the spring. Or if you're okay with the idea that maybe being a free elective, if you decide you don't love it, it's a good way to sample the course. So you can do it right away. Just depends on how you want to think about it. Then 
You'll also see here in the first semester that there's that one credit course where you pick engineering graphics and CAD or engineering communication. This is another one where fall or spring are your first year. Doesn't matter which one. Anytime you take it, I recommend engineering communication. It is much easier. And for what you all will be doing, um, there's really no need to go into the harder course. Both times you will learn CAD, but communication will transition to Microsoft Office and just be a little more pleasant for you. So fall or spring doesn't matter on that one. So if we're moving things around, we have to obviously talk about things we can move up. So one of those is the science electives. And if you see any of these little general categories other than Haas, you're like, what counts for that? Usually it's down on the template. So for the science electives, you can take intro to biology, cell and molecular bio, but almost no one does. It's very hard. Don't do it. And then um, you could also do chemistry. So those courses can be taken at any time. So if you're moving some stuff around, that's a good candidate to move up. And then also, don't be fooled by physics being in the second year on the template. Um, I would actually say if you're planning to move this ECSD requirement to the spring, physics one is actually my favorite thing to move up because physics becomes very important in your template because it's part of a sequence to get to circuits. And this circuits class, you'll probably, if you have Professor Bronstein for ECSD 1010, he seems to want just everyone to be in a dead sprint of circuits. So take that with a grain of salt. You don't have to get there immediately, but physics is part of that path. So starting it early is never a bad thing. And then let's see, last thing or two I'll touch on here is um, if you have credit for Calc 1 and 2, you are eligible to take either differential equations or multivariable calc. Um, Either one would be fine. Again, because of the circuits prerequisites, I would say if you could do differential equations first, that would be great. But either way, you're probably very ahead if you're taking one of those your first semester, so don't stress about it too much. The last thing I'll talk about is data structures. So data structures, there like there are some of you who might have credit for computer science, AP computer science and have top side eleven hundred credit. So what I can say is I have had students who have gone straight from AP computer science to data structures, and surprisingly enough, they actually tend to do pretty well. However, data structures is a very, 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 add all the very hard class. It is one of the hardest at RPI. A lot of students say it's like taking an eight credit class. It is a big time commitment, very rigorous class. Um, it is all in C++. So my recommendation is generally if you, like basically if you have some experience in C++, you could probably jump in your first semester and be okay. And again, the data says people tend to do pretty well if they go from AP comp sci to straight to data structures. But I would also say this is a decision you want to think a lot about because data structures is no joke. So that about covers um, what I want to talk about on this template for now. But before we move on, I also want to show you some templates for dual majors, because those are kind of popular for your for CFEs. So this will just have to switch back to my browser for a moment. OK, so within ECFC, there are like two popular duals that happen for computer system students. Now, I would still say like 75% or more of my computer system students are not dual majors. So don't feel like this is something you have to do or should do. Um, but in terms of options, one of them is the electrical and computer systems dual major. Um, the curriculum overlaps a lot. So as you can see here, it's about an extra seven credits over four years, but this is kind of how it looks built out um, if you don't come in with any sort of transfer credits. So that is EECSE. Uh, it happens. It's not the most popular. The one that a lot of my CSEs go gaga for is down here, which is computer systems, computer science. So for this one, there is one thing I want to make you aware of on the front end. If this is something you're considering, there are criteria to be able to declare computer science as a dual. So that criteria is you either need to get a B or better in data structures by itself, or if you don't get a B or better, they're going to look at your average grade between computer science one, data structures, and foundations of computer science. And if that average is a B or better, then you would be able to declare the dual. Um, so just mentioning all that on the front end, you don't want any surprises, but uh, people have asked about duals outside of these. And for those, I would say let's talk more on a one-on-one -on -one basis. 
with a lot of dual majors as you start looking into having to spend extra semesters or even extra years here and oftentimes you can think of a way to maybe get at what you're looking at with a better use of your time so that will cover the templates and then let's look at the major planning sheet which is something i sent out to you not too long ago so back to microsoft word So basically this, temp, this planning sheet is to kind of give some form and function to that template. So basically this is where you would really want to know what credits you have because it tells you what to do. So basically everything above this bold font is that first semester um, that's on the template and some instructions on what to do. So again, 98% of you are gonna be taking computer science one your first semester. We've had that data structures conversation if you already have comp sci one credit. Then again, we've already had that ECSE conversation. You have the option to do IEA. Um, moving on to math, again, we've touched on this, so it gives you the little flow chart of what to take. And then CAD or communications can be done this fall or this spring, no worries either way. And we've talked about Haas, but obviously some of you may say you want to put off the ECSE requirement or you might have wanted to move some things around, that's fine. So this helps you figure out just basically every single option that you do have. So moving along, you can do physics one. If you have credit for physics one, you could substitute in physics two. Now I would caveat physics two in saying that is also known to be a very challenging course here. Doesn't have quite as brutal of a reputation as data structures and they have improved it recently. Um, but again, physics two is one where I would definitely not make the jump unless I felt comfortable with doing so, feeling grounded in physics. Then the science selective is obviously a great backup. You could do chem or bio. And then if you have like tons of AP credits, like 20 plus, and you really are all the way down here looking for options, if you're one of those people with credit for computer science one, then some potential options for you are ECSE 2610, which is computer components and operations or COCO. And you also can consider Engineering 2350, which is embedded control. And a lot of students on campus will call that LIHTC. Now, those are pretty heavy hitting, but obviously um, those aren't really gonna be on the table unless you have a ton of credits. And then last but not least are free electives. So we touched on that a little bit in the template, but basically all engineering majors need 12 credits of free electives over their time here. And most classes at Rensselaer are four credits, so ends up being three classes total. Um, those can be anything. Free means free. So it could be more engineering courses. It could be extra HOS courses. It could be management. It could be science. It really is your 12 credits to kind of have fun. So definitely always a possibility for backups. But the only reason it's all the way at the end of the list is that's often where people will put a minor. So that's something they want to go for or same with a dual. So we try to have people save them for their first semester or so. Just that way, if you find you want to do something new, you have space to do it. So that about covers how we figure out our credits and what we might be interested in. But then once we know what classes we might want, we need to build a schedule. So let's again switch our screens and go over to YAX. So I'm sure and I hope that some of you have already been playing around in here, but this is what helps you visualize the different possibilities for your schedule. One thing that's really cool is that this is built by RPI students and it's through a thing called Arcos, which you can get involved in if you like to program for fun. So looking at EAC, we can make all the possible schedules in the world. So what we're gonna do is throw in just a couple of classes and again, there's a whole video on this for you guys, so we're not gonna try to belabor the point, but if you want to consider all sections of a course, then click on this title up here. It'll highlight all of them, if I actually click correctly. And then once they're highlighted, you can hit schedule to add them to the scheduling tool. And so you keep going. Let's pretend I have a couple more credits and we're going to tell the schedule. And then I was a psychology major in undergrad, so I'm going to say everyone should take psych. That's not true. You don't have to take psych, but it's really great. Um, and then uh, let's put in one more thing. Let's say 
Now, once you add all the classes you're considering, you might end up with some ungodly amount of schedules to look through. So obviously 448 is a lot and uh, you probably have better things to do with your time. So the best way I can suggest to kind of narrow things down is to just start unchecking ones on the screen based on whatever criteria is valid to you. So for me, I like getting up early. I like to get my day out of the way early. So maybe I would take out all of these three o'clock classes. And then just by doing that, I've cut about 30 schedules and then maybe I'll say, I, I'm just gonna start clicking random things, but, and then removing those, I've cut over 200. So you kind of can refine a little bit. And then once you have, you would scroll along and it shows you every possible permutation of your schedule. And then once you find one you like, so let's pretend this is my favorite, then what you'll want to do is write down these CRNs. So CRN stands for course registration number, and every section has its own unique one. And those are what you're going to use to officially register for classes. Now, before we move to talk about how to register in SIS, I would say I want you to have th like at least three schedules, like plan A, plan B, plan C. So three separate lists of these CRNs, just that way in case something full, then you have a fallback. So with that being said, let's move on to how to register in SIS, and then we'll be just about at the end of me talking at you. So. All right, let's make this full screen. All right, and this will be shown through the perspective of a student login. We had a student very graciously agree to help us because mine would look a little different as a staff member. So to log into SIS, this will be the first page you land on. If you haven't logged in already, the PIN will default to your birthday and the formatting will be month, month, day, day, year, year. Um, I would definitely recommend trying to log in maybe today, but just if you haven't already, make sure it's all set to go before Monday. People get locked out of their SIS accounts by messing up the password more often than you'd expect. So it's nice to just get it all smooth on the front end. So once you've logged in, this is how it will look. And you are going to take your YAC schedule and make it a real thing in here. So you're going to want to click on the student menu tab, and this is how it'll look once you do. So we're going to kind of skip through class search a little bit quickly, but basically I would say class search is good if let's say you type in all your CRMs and then like three out of the four work and just calc one, that section's full, you want to change that. In that case, I wouldn't say like go to a full blown plan B schedule, but you could just search up the class in here. And so in here you can see mathematics 10, 10 calc one. And then you can scroll around and see which ones are still open. That way you can just kind of patch your schedule instead of having to totally redo it. If something has a checkbox like over here, that means it is open. And if it has a C, that means it is full. And you can kind of see that in um, this side of the thing. So cap equals capacity, how many people could be in the class. Active shows how many people are actively registered for it. And remaining shows how many seats remain. Um, a lot of people will be rolling out with each time ticket. So I don't want you all to panic if you're looking on Yax or SIS now and some things are like have zero seats or look like they're not um, like working. They will be rolling them out with each time ticket to make sure people aren't disadvantaged and locked out of classes based on when their time ticket is. So a big part of registration is you will want to go back to the student menu and go to register, add, or drop. And then make sure you're in the right term, fall 2019. And then here is the CRN worksheet. So this is where you're going to take that list that you made in YAX of those CRNs, and you type one CRN per box, and then put them all in at once. And the reason that's important is, this only is a thing for about two of the classes that you might be taking, but some classes have what are called co-requisites, where you have to register for two separate things at once for it to work. In your case, where that, you may see that is for Physics 1, I believe I emailed you all earlier this week, but if you're taking Physics 1, you have to take a Physics Mentoring section with it. So that would be Physics 1100 and Physics 1960. If you try to put through one without the other, it would kick back an error message. You have to do them together. The other class where you may see that is if you've decided to do your science elective, Biology would be the same. You need Biology 1010, Biology 1015. Either way, it's just nice to send in all your CRNs at once anyway to make things more seamless. 
So and then this is what you should see if it works. So once you see this, if you see registered via web, it's official. You're in, you don't have to hit, there's nowhere you have to like hit save to make it official. Like this shows you are in that class. Um, so that is your proof that it works. If something is wrong, like a class is full or something, it will have like a little red error message down here. So some common ones you might see would be closed section. So if someone grabs the last date in your favorite count section right before you, you know where to go pick another one. Another one that you might see is a major restriction or a field of study restriction. This would probably only happen if you're picking like a very niche class class. But basically that would mean that it's restricted to that major. So let's pretend you went to go take sculpture. It might be restricted to arts majors. So in those cases, I would say in the moment, register for a backup class class. And then you could always try emailing the professor of the one you were trying to get into to see if they'd be willing to override you in. And then last thing you might see is if you forget to put in all your CRMs at once and you mess up that prerequisite thing, then it might not allow it. Last thing I would say people will come across is if you um, went from YAC to SIS and got things a little mixed up, if two CRNs you put in at once have a time conflict, like they run at the same time and you're not Hermione and don't have a time turner to sit in two classes at once, then it's going to give you a conflict message and neither one will go through. So I know it's like scary to see things flash in red, but don't panic. It usually tells you exactly what's wrong and there's generally a way through. And if you're not sure how to get through something, then obviously feel free to email me, feel free to call me um, and we'll work through it. So. Basically, all we need to hear. And last thing is, if you want to just check your schedule at the end to make sure all looks as you'd expect, then go to the student menu, click weekly schedule daytime grid, and then you will need to change the date to one in the fall semester because it's going to default to the current week and you're not taking classes this week. So just type in a week in September and it'll pull it up. So you can see this is scheduled from the student from fall 2017. We already covered these notes about all CRNs and the co-rex sys. And then last but not least, when in doubt, believe sys over YAX. So YAX is an amazing tool for visualizing schedules, but it's not always 100% in real time with the server for SIS. So with that being said, sometimes it'll say something's open when it's not, and vice versa, it'll sometimes say something's closed when a seat just opened. So you get to visualize some things, but day of, I would say use that class search in SIS if you have to patch up your schedule a little bit. And if you have any issues beyond like academic planning during registration, like you can't get into your SIS account or something like that, then you want to talk to the registrar's office because they handle the technological logistics of all of this. Um, so if, again, if you're locked out of your SIS account, like I can't do anything about it, the registrar can. Again, that it works today. And that is basically all we have to cover today. So I'm going to make my way over to the chat because I know I saw some questions coming up already. And then if you have more questions, start typing. I will start talking. Because, you know, I haven't talked to you enough yet. You'll come to learn I talk a lot. Okay. So let's see. All right. So it looks like the first question is, can you only transfer higher level ID credit or standard level also? Good question. So RPI only accepts the higher level ID credit exams. If you go into the registration guide and scroll to that spot with the transfer credits, we actually made some really nice condensed um, tables that show exactly what each test translates to here at RPI and how you can use that credit. If you click on that table, it'll become bigger and you'll see the whole thing. But good question, only the higher level ones, unfortunately. Okay. And then the next question is, if you move physics one up to your first semester, does the science elective move to your second year? Um, the answer is honestly that it depends. So the science elective is not a prerequisite for any other course in your template. So you could literally take that at the end of senior year if you wanted to. Um, so that is definitely something that's extremely flexible as to where you put it. I've had students do it first semester, second semester, land it into their arch semester. So the science elective timing is not very important. So it's going to mainly move where you think it would be most convenient for you. Where can I find the curriculum checklist? Good question. So if you go into the computer systems registration guide, which is on the Adobe Spark pages that we sent out, 
um, it'll be in section one. If you scroll down, you should be able to see the whole thing. If you're having trouble accessing that, then just shoot me an email and I will send you a Word doc version. Right, Val's been throwing lots of links, which is great. All right, let's see. Should I plan B, C, and D schedules to be the same courses with different times or a different combination of courses? Ooh, that's a very good question. Um, so the overachiever and me says, why not both? So I would say probably have at least two versions of the same classes. Um, and then I would, in terms of like the different combinations of courses, I would say it could be good to have one or two backups, like especially let's say like with a different Haas course. Cause like there's, I'm not really worried about you all getting into like computer science and your math class. Like a section should definitely work. It might not be your favorite one, but that we could probably always find another section. But if you found a Haas class that has 20 seats that you really love, well, that's a little more likely that it might fill up. So I would say have a couple where you're just switching the time around, but particularly for things like the Haas class, maybe have one or two backup Haas classes in particular that you'd be willing to look at, because I think that'll really help if you get stuck. Good question. What else do you guys have? Is there a shopping period at the beginning of the academic year in which students add or drop courses to their choosing before schedules are finalized, just like other colleges? So in a way, yeah. So that two week period at the beginning of the semester is called the add drop. So basically during those two weeks, as you mentioned, you can add or drop courses to your heart's content. Um, I would say we don't call it shopping, but yeah, during those first two weeks, you could literally change your schedule a hundred times if you had the time to energy to do so. So it's pretty flexible. And they, one thing I don't know if I really clarified enough is that obviously you all will be registering next week, but we are going to have infinite chances to change this because obviously when you all come for your orientation, um, myself and the other, other hub advisors will be kicking around so we can definitely help you change things then. And then again, in that ad drop period in the beginning, as you start going to classes and seeing what you like and don't like, you'll have two weeks to change that then as well. So definitely don't feel like this is do or die Monday. We have a lot of time to change things. Good question. What else? I made a couple of schedules on YAC and they look very good, except that I have five classes on one day. Is that too much to handle in a day? So I think this will be an unsatisfying answer, but the answer I would say is it really depends on you and what kind of like thinker and what kind of person you are. So I would say if you're having a lot of classes on one day, my big suggestion would be at the very least, just make sure you have time to eat. Like that's very important. So I would say if you've got like five classes wall to wall where you can't stop and eat lunch, I wouldn't recommend that. But beyond that, it really becomes a student by student preference thing as to whether you prefer to have your schedule spread out over the week and have like two or three classes a day every day, or if you want to have some heavier days where you'll plump like five classes on one day, but then have Tuesday, Thursday off or something. Um, I know throughout my time in undergrad, I started spread out and then found out that I preferred to clump things, um, but there's no right or wrong there. So I would say if you are happy with the way the schedule looks, just make sure you have time to eat <laughs> or take a breather. And then um, again, during that ad drop in the first two weeks, if you're like, okay, I'm burning out by class four, then we can always switch to a different section of one of those classes or two or three, whatever you want. <laughs> Oh, hold on, I gotta scroll up so I can see the entirety of this question. All right, if I didn't pass several of my APs with a high enough exam score, but I passed their more advanced counterparts while dual enrolling at a local university, will I need to retake RPI's equivalence of the AP courses? Good question. So if you've received credit through another university, so like let's pretend you were living right here in Troy and your high school had a connection to Hudson Valley Community College. If you've earned those college credits, you have earned them. So if so, um, in the video in the registration guide in section three, I would make sure to definitely watch the latter half because what you'll need to do is send an official transcript from the college, not your high school, the college, 
to RPI. And then you will also need to fill out the high school certification form, which is just where your principal or guidance counselor signs off that you didn't need to take college level credit to graduate high school. And basically no state does, so that's pretty much never a problem. But yeah, it, it doesn't matter if you didn't pass the AP, if you have the college credit through that local university. And off the top of my head, I think the minimum grade you would have had to get for getting credit at a local university is a C. So as long as you have to see your better, send that transcript over and assume you have credit. And you can definitely check to see if that university is in our transfer course guide so that you can kind of start figuring out what equivalents you have. Okay, and then another question is, so if I got three on, yes. Yeah, so again, double check the transfer course guide just to make sure everything looks good. Um, I will say Calc 2, depending on what community college you go to, gets a little bit funky in terms of how it transfers. So double check the transfer course guide to see if you have credit for Math 1020. Um, Val has just dropped the link, which is awesome. Uh, so you can look up your college there. And if you got an A in the class while dual enrolling, that's fine. Ignore your AP score, keep going. And again, if you look at the transfer course guide and something doesn't make sense or you have questions, feel free to email me. I'm happy to look at it. Good questions, guys. What else? The email to contact me. I will type it. Also, one link I'll drop in the description. Um, when we were talking about those dual major templates before, this is where I was looking at them. I do want to caveat these are the class of 2022. So the people who are rising sophomores right now, they generally finalize all the new templates in like August. But for the first two years, nothing's really going to be tangibly different for any of those duels. But if you want to start looking at them to see what that might bring, then feel free. What else? Any other questions? I'm loving the spirit on a Friday morning, guys. You're going to do very well if you can be this lively at 8 a.m. on a Friday here. If you have credit for Chem 1 from AP, could you take Chem 2 as your science elective in the spring? Good question. If you have credit for Chem 1, you are done with your science elective. You don't have to take a higher level course. Um, if you really would like to take chemistry too, at that point, it would be a free elective for you. But if you've got chem one, you are done. Anything else? Give it like another 10 seconds in case someone's typing. Is there somewhere we could look at teacher recommendations for courses? Um, nothing official. Uh, I would say, uh, as in which, like, which teachers, professors, students really like. Um, there's nothing official in house, but um, you could always. RPI has a pretty active presence on Reddit, so you could check out the RPI subreddit and look up the classes you're interested in. Those threads have come up many times. Um, I would probably say that's your best option. There's Rate My Professor, but I would say for Rate My Professor, always take that with a grain of salt because it kind of has the same effect of Yelp reviews that only the people who are really, really happy and really, really angry are going to post and you miss that whole middle ground. So I'd say if anything, maybe look at the subreddit. You usually get a bit more of a balanced perspective there. Okay. Should my schedule be exactly 16 credits for the semester? I would say the goal is 16 or 17. So um, if you're thinking of taking CAD or communications your first semester, then it can be 17. Otherwise, I would really say stay at 16. There's all the time in the world to overload once you've gotten your bearings here, but I really don't think there's a need to do that your first semester. You want to leave yourself some time to adjust. When registering, do we specify what courses we have credit for, like the science elective? Um, so there's no way that you have to input what credits you have already because of the fact that a lot of the AP scores are coming out later. The registrar's office has turned off a lot of the prerequisites. So, for example, like if you during a normal semester only had credit for Calc 1 and tried to register all the way up to differential equations, it would say like, no, bad, you didn't take Calc 2. They've turned all that off. That way you all don't have trouble with the fact that some of those things aren't in. 
So you don't have to enter that anywhere. Um, just build the schedule as you need for what credit you do have, and then the system should be pretty accepting of it. Ooh, very good question. So the previous year's dual major template for computer science and computer systems has biology as a science elective, but could I use chemistry instead? Good question. And the sad answer is no. So biology is specific, a specific requirement for computer science, whereas computer systems is more flexible. But to make sure that this is as condensed as possible, they do force the science elective in the dual to be biology. Um, it's actually a requirement for every major in the School of Science. So unfortunately, if you're doing the dual for computer science, computer systems, it does have to be biology and not chemistry. That's a really good question. Loving it, guys. Anything else? Give it like another 10 seconds again, just in case of typing. All right, well, this seems like it might be the end of the question train. But obviously, if anything else comes up, then please feel free to email me. Um, I am usually pretty dang fast. So, oh, one more. So let's see. Does RPI usually accept SUNY Schenectady Community College and UAlbany credits? Big yes. Um, those are some very popular transfer institutions for us. So definitely check the transfer course guide and you can cross check what class you took at that school and what it would become here. But we have, especially UAlbany, and I see the most, but um, both of those, we should have a lot of equivalency. Good one. I'll give another 10 second period in case someone's typing and I didn't know. Okay, well, as I said, if there's a question, oh, sorry. <laughs> so let's see, I've heard that varsity sports are a huge time commitment and was wondering whether it might make more sense to try to start in sophomore year instead. Um, well, it's gonna be a time commitment no matter when you do it. Um, a lot of folks do it their first year. So I would say if you're trying to walk on, then it wouldn't hurt to make contact with the coach earlier rather than later. Um, but basically there are, it is a big time commitment, but also the athletes will like change their class schedule to kind of account for practices and stuff like that. So generally speaking, athletes won't take classes after four o'clock, things like that. Um, so I would say talk to the coach of the specific team that you're looking at potentially trying out for or walking on if you're not already on one and see what their practice schedule looks like and all of that. Um, again, it is a big time commitment, but we have a lot of student athletes here and a lot of them do really well. I think having the support of the upperclassmen in such close contact really kind of helps get over some of those bumps. Awesome. All right. I'm trying to think I'm going to do like a 15, 20 second break. <laughs> If you use two AP transfer credits for Haas, how important is it to take an IHSS in your first semester? Uh, so I would say pretty important. The reason being that you have to take an I, basically it's the idea if you want to be done with Haas as soon as possible, if you use two, trans, two classes from transfer credit, you have three classes left to do. A pathway is three classes. So if we're trying to be as efficient as possible, we want to pick a pathway where we can hit the IHSS, the pathway, obviously, and the communication intensive requirement all in one shot. Now, if you are like, I don't really hate Haas classes, like that sounds interesting enough to me, and I don't mind if one goes to free elective, then that's totally fine. Um, but I would say if you have two trans AP transfer cards, really start looking at those pathways and really potentially consider doing the IHSS. HSS. Um, there is the possibility that you might find some pathways that like have a course one that doesn't have to be an IHSS, but you have to take one at some point anyway. Um, more important to look at the fall if you already have two transfer credits. Good one. All right. 
another typing break. <laughs> Okay, well, as before, if something else pops up while I'm talking, I will answer it. But again, I'm glad to have had all of you come on with me. Um, and again, any questions that come up, feel free to email me. I know Monday will be a big day for registration, um, but I will be here on Monday, 8 to 4.30. So feel free to email, feel free to call. Um, email generally will get you a faster response, but either one's fine. And this video will be available to watch again probably this afternoon uh, once I hit finish the recording. This is our very last webinar, so it shouldn't take too long to get it up on YouTube. But uh, again, thank you all for joining me. I'm really, really, really excited to meet you. So enjoy the end of high school, and I will see you all soon. Bye!